Now approaching our 23rd year of service to the amateur radio community around the world, we are This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1183 of This Week in Amateur Radio. International Amateur Radio Union Region 1 Monitoring System reports an escalation in the Russia-Ukraine radio wars on the HF bands. We will have a report. Amateur Radio and Skywarn respond to a major nor'easter hitting the U.S. northeast coast. The ARRL concurs with two FCC World Radio Communication Conference advisory draft positions. President Biden nominates Jessica Rosenworcel as the new FCC chair and announces other nominations to the FCC and the NTIA. The FCC revokes China Telecom America's wireless service authority in the United States. A well-known DX contester has passed away in a small plane crash. We will have the details. In the UK next month, you will be able to order pizza from one national chain in Morse code. You heard that right. And we will tell you about a group of hams that started a new online forum to celebrate the classic Henry amplifiers. All this and a lot more is straight ahead on this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will talk about a recent publication put out by the Oregon FBI office covering recommendations for your IoT, Internet of Things, devices, and he will also talk about the fifth generation communications technology with a quick overview of the 5G frequency allocations. Australia's own Arnold Benshop, VK6FLAB, will be here with Foundations of Amateur Radio. This week, he will talk about how to run a single sideband contest without using your own voice. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOI, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill continues to look at the great VHF frequency battle of 1947. Our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, will have a wrap-up on completing your annual tower inspection before the snow flies. That's all straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio here in what I'm told is not Albany, New York, I'm George W2XBS. And reporting from the newsroom in Half Moon, New York, I'm Terry Saunders, N1KIN. And reporting this week from the ham shack of K2MST at the Museum of Science and Technology in downtown Syracuse, New York, I'm Chris Perrine, KB2FAF. And from just outside Albany, New York, in the Geek Cave Studios, I'm Rich Lawrence, KB2MOB. And from Studio One of our Central Florida News Bureau, located in historic Mount Dora, Florida, I'm Fred, November Fox 2 Fox. And reporting from our Trade New York News Bureau, where we're just getting ready to move our clocks back, I'm Eric, KD2RJX. And reporting from our News Bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where Old Man Winter has sent summer and autumn packing, <laughs> I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. And now with this week's lead story, here is Terry Saunders, N1KIN. Leading off this week's news, the International Amateur Radio Union Region 1 Monitoring System reports in the September issue of their newsletter that the Russian-Ukrainian radio war on and around 7055 kilohertz continues to be a major source of frustration. International Amateur Radio Union Region 1 Monitoring System Coordinator Peter Yost, HB9CET, said on-the-air conflict has been bothering us to an unbearable extent for a very long time and is still continuing. Earlier this year, the International Amateur Radio Union Region 1 Monitoring System reported that the Russian-Ukrainian radio war had escalated. In June, they used more frequencies than before, affecting our bands very hard, Yost recounted. It's a great annoyance and a big shame. Yost has pointed out that the IARU monitoring system has little opportunity to stop on-the-air conflict. 
Only national authorities can hopefully do something against international complaints, he said. It is very important and very helpful that many other IARU member societies also observe these frequencies and make complaints to their regulators. The long-standing conflict has also affected 7050 and 7060 kilohertz. A major nor'easter struck eastern Massachusetts and Rhode Island this week, with ferocious winds stronger than those that Tropical Storm Henry brought to the region in August. With more details on this recent major storm to hit the Northeast, we go to Steve Richards, G4HPE, who files this report from the UK Southgate Amateur Radio News. Starting on the evening of October the 26th, Eastern Massachusetts storm spotting amateur radio operators of the Amateur Radio Emergency Service and the National Weather Service Skywarn teams joined forces to help emergency services provide a focused and effective response as the powerful Northeaster caused widespread damage. Trees and overhead wire damage, trees falling on homes and cars, and a few cases of direct structural damage to weakened buildings have been reported. Aries and Skywarn operations will continue until the impact of the weather system subsides. Rob Macedo, Kilo Delta One Charlie Yankee, said that they've handled several hundred reports of damage, and photos of damage are streaming in from Aries and Skywarn operators to support damage assessment efforts and to keep the National Weather Service in Norton updated with the severe weather conditions affecting the region. Aries and Skywarn operators relayed reports of hurricane-force wind gusts reaching 94 miles per hour in Edgartown, 84 miles per hour in Dennis, 79 miles per hour in Sandwich, and 78 miles per hour in Rockport, all these locations around the Massachusetts area. Cape Cod Aries and Skywarn and South Coast Skywarn amateur operators communicated with Whiskey X-Ray 1 Bravo Oscar X-Ray, the amateur radio station located at the Norton National Weather Service, and completed overnight operations when the peak winds occurred. Rob Macedo said that the dedication of the volunteers to provide critical information to the weather service, the media and emergency managers in a major storm like this was gruelling, but it was critical to inform people about what is happening during such a significant storm, so that when they wake up in the morning, they will hopefully make safe decisions to avoid venturing out in a significant severe wind situation. Cape Cod Aries was activated by the Barnstable County Regional Emergency Planning Committee to staff the Multi-Agency Coordination Centre at their Emergency Operations Centre. The damage, power outages and intermittent cell phone service from some providers could mean an extended activation for Aries members in Cape Cod and the islands. The Aries District Emergency Coordinator in that area, Franco Lochlin, Whiskey Quebec One Oscar, said that damage assessments in the region would give a better sense of how long it will take to restore power and in some cases communication services to the Cape Cod and Islands area, and that will determine how long Aries will be needed and if additional support from neighbouring groups such as Eastern Massachusetts Aries will be needed. KD1CY called the storm one of the more extraordinary weather systems within the last few years and the most significant of several other major amateur radio activations in the past year. As many as 500,000 customers lost power in eastern Massachusetts, with hardest hit areas in southeastern Massachusetts, Cape Cod, the Islands and the Cape Ann area of North Boston, where hurricane-forced wind gusts pummeled the region for several hours. Maximum sustained winds were 50 to 65 miles per hour. Rhode Island reported nearly 93,000 customers without power at the peak. These outages were an order of magnitude greater than during Tropical Storm Henri on Rhode Island and about five orders of magnitude more severe than Henri in Massachusetts. Storm conditions wound down toward the evening of October 27th, allowing the process of more widespread power restoration to begin. ARRL has told the Federal Communications Commission that it agrees with two World Radio Communication Conference Advisory Committee draft positions on WRC 23 agenda items, but with conditions. For more on this story and its potential impact on amateur radio, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, who files this report from League Headquarters. ARRL is represented on the WAC and is participating in its work. 
With respect to Agenda Item 1.12, ARRL recommends that the U.S. support studies and possible consideration of a new allocation to the Earth Exploration Satellite Service active on a secondary basis within the frequency range of 40 to 50 megahertz for space-borne radar sounders. ARRL conditioned its support on explicitly including in the recommendation the need to provide protection for and not impose constraints on incumbent services in adjacent frequency bands, in this case six meters. ARRL said it expects that studies will identify the capability and adequate means to protect the weak signal amateur operations on the adjacent 50 to 54 megahertz band without imposing any constraint on those operations if the need to use this spectrum for space-borne radars is confirmed. ARRL also expressed its support for the WAC's draft recommendation on Agenda Item 9.1 Topic A, Space Weather Sensors, the WAC draft recommendation is that the U.S. view be that changes to the radio regulations are outside the scope of Agenda Item 9.1 and that the U.S. express its support for conducting studies already called for and underway. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. ARRL based its support on provisions that amateur radio allocations are protected and amateur operations are not constrained. These two items consider spectrum requirements for the Earth Exploration Satellite Service, called ACTIVE, and the results of studies relating to space weather sensors. The FCC International Bureau issued a call for comments on the two draft recommendations on September 30th. ARRL Technical Relations Specialist John Silverling, WB3ERA represents ARRL on the WAC and is actively participating in its work to prepare U.S. positions for WRC 23. The committee draft includes a statement recognizing the need to protect and not impose constraints on incumbent services in adjacent frequency bands. Our support for the draft recommendation is conditioned on explicitly including in the recommendation the need to provide protection and to not impose constraint on incumbent services in adjacent frequency bands, ARRL said in its comments. ARRL noted that use of 50 to 54 megahertz by radio amateurs was recently studied and documented in ITU radio communication report M.2478-0. ARRL noted the extremely broad scope of resolution 657, which covers frequencies from 13 kilohertz through at least 15 gigahertz, potentially impacting virtually all radio amateur operation. ARRL further stated that ITUR has undertaken studies relating to the technical and operational characteristics and spectrum requirements of space weather sensors and that completion and consideration of these studies are essential to achieving the desired objective of not placing any additional constraints on incumbent services. Radio amateurs have a significant interest in space weather and its impacts, ARRL said, citing NASA and NSF grants to fund amateur radio-related space weather projects. One such project includes developing an empirical model for predicting traveling ionospheric disturbances at HF using data collected over an 11-year solar cycle using automated global-scale radio communications networks operated by the amateur radio community. The reference networks are known to amateurs worldwide as WSPR, RBN, and PSK Reporter. Another project involves developing two ground-based space weather stations. One is being developed by Tucson Amateur Packet Radio and is codenamed Tangerine. The other is being developed by Case Western University and the Case Amateur Radio Club W8EDU and is codenamed Grape. HamSci founder and Scranton University professor Nathaniel Frizzell, W2NAF, is leading both space weather efforts. On October 25th, President Joe Biden this week designated FCC Acting Chairwoman Jessica Rosenworcel to become the 35th permanent leader of the FCC. 
with the approval of the Senate on Capitol Hill, she would become the first woman at the helm of the agency on a permanent basis. President Biden announced that he also intends to nominate another to fill the open seat on the commission. Rosen Worsell, a Democrat, is the first woman to head the commission. She has served on the FCC since 2012. Prior to joining the FCC, Chairwoman Rosenzell served as Senior Communications Counsel for the U.S. Senate Committee on Commerce, Science, and Transportation. Before entering public service, she practiced communications law. She is a native of Hartford, Connecticut, and a graduate of Wesleyan University and New York University School of Law. The president also announced that he plans to appoint Democrat Gigi Sohn to fill the other Democratic slot on the commission. If confirmed, Sohn would be the first openly LGBTIQ plus commissioner in the history of the FCC. Sohn is a distinguished fellow at the Georgetown Law Institute for Technology, Law, and Policy, and a Benton Senior Fellow and Public Advocate. She served from 2013 until 2016 as counsel to former FCC Chairman Tom Wheeler. Prior to that, she co-founded and served as CEO of Public Knowledge, a communications and technology policy advocacy organization. She has a bachelor's degree in broadcasting and film from Boston University and earned her law degree at the University of Pennsylvania Law School. Rosen Worsell said she is deeply humbled to be designated as FCC chair. It is an honor to work with my colleagues on the commission and the agency's talented staff to ensure that no matter who you are or where you live, everyone has the connections they need to live, work, and learn in the digital age, she said. I also want to congratulate Gigi Sohn on her nomination to serve as a commissioner at the agency and Alla Davidson on his nomination to serve as Assistant Secretary for Communications and Information at the National Telecommunications and Information Administration. In her time at the commission, Rosen Worsell has worked to promote greater opportunity, accessibility, and affordability in our communication services in order to ensure that all Americans get a fair shot at 21st century success. From fighting to protect an open internet to ensuring broadband access for students caught in the homework gap through the FCC's Emergency Connectivity Fund, to making sure that households struggling to afford internet services stay connected through the Emergency Broadband Benefit Program. She's been a champion for connectivity for all. She is a leader in spectrum policy, developing new ways to support wireless services from Wi-Fi to video and the Internet of Things. She has fought to combat illegal robocalls and enhance consumer protections with our telecommunications policies. The other commission members are Republican Brendan Carr, Democrat Jeffrey Starks, and Republican Nathan Sigmonton. The political composition of the FCC typically favors the president's party. Biden also announced his intention to nominate Alan Davidson as Assistant Secretary for Communications and Information at the National Telecommunications and Information Administration within the U.S. Department of Commerce. The NTIA oversees the management of spectrum allocated to the federal government. The Federal Communications Commission adopted an order ending China Telecom America's Corporation's ability to provide domestic, interstate, and international telecommunication services within the United States. The order on revocation and termination directs China Telecom Americas to discontinue any domestic or international services that it provides pursuant to its Section 214 authority within 60 days following the release of the order. Promoting national security is an integral part of the Commission's responsibility to advance the public interest, and today's action carries out that mission to safeguard the nation's telecommunications infrastructure from potential security threats. Based in part on the recommendation of the executive branch agencies, the Commission found that China Telecom Americas failed to rebut the serious concerns of the executive branch about its continued presence in the United States. In December 2020, the Commission launched a proceeding and established a process that allowed for China Telecom Americas, the executive branch agencies, and the public to present any remaining arguments or evidence in the matter. Today, based on the totality of the extensive unclassified record alone, the Commission's public interest analysis finds that the present and future public interest, convenience, and necessity is no longer served by China Telecom America's retention of its Section 214 authority. First, today's order finds that China Telecom Americas, a U.S. subsidiary of a Chinese state-owned enterprise, is subject to exploitation, influence, and control by the Chinese government and is highly likely to be forced to comply with Chinese government requests without sufficient legal procedures subject to independent judicial oversight. 
Second, given the changed national security environment with respect to China since the Commission authorized China Telecom Americas to provide telecommunication services in the United States almost two decades ago, the order finds that China Telecom Americas' ownership and control by the Chinese government raised significant national security and law enforcement risks by providing opportunities for China Telecom Americas, its parent entities, and the Chinese government to access, store, disrupt, and or misroute U.S. communications, which in turn allow them to engage in espionage and other their harmful activities against the United States. Third, China Telecom America's conduct and representations to the Commission and other U.S. government agencies demonstrate a lack of candor, trustworthiness, and reliability that erodes the baseline level of trust that the Commission and other U.S. government agencies require of telecommunications carriers given the critical nature of the provision of telecommunications service in the United States. Fourth, the order finds that further mitigation would not address these significant national security and law enforcement concerns. Fifth, the order finds that China Telecom Americas willfully violated two of the five provisions of the 2007 Letter of Assurances with the executive branch agencies, compliance with which is an express condition of its international Section 214 authorizations. Finally, although it is not necessary to support these findings and conclusions, the order finds that the classified evidence submitted by the executive branch agencies further supports the decisions to revoke the domestic authority and revoke and terminate the international authorizations issued to China Telecom Americas and the determination that further mitigation will not address the substantial national security and law enforcement risks. To assist U.S. customers with transitioning to other mobile service providers as a result of China Telecom America's discontinued services, the FCC will issue a consumer guide after the order's release that explains this action and what other options consumers might consider for mobile services. This document will be available in English, simplified Chinese, and traditional Chinese, and made available on the Commission's website. Additionally, the consumer guide will be sent to news outlets to further raise awareness to China Telecom America's customers. Here's some information from the American Polish Eagle website. In memory of what was once the radio transmission station with the second tallest mast in the world, scientists in Poland are looking to set up a museum to commemorate its history. Built after Poland regained independence at the end of the First World War, by 1923 half of Europe was sending telegrams to the USA via the Transatlantic Radio Telegraphic Broadcasting Centre in Warsaw. Consisting of 10 massive 126 metre tall towers, that's over 430 feet, the radio station's transmitter was powerful enough to reach both North and South America. The Warsaw Station was also one of the best equipped in the world, with two machine transmitters of 200 kilowatts each, being powered by a 500 kilowatt diesel powered generator, ensuring 24 hour communication with North America. When World War II broke out following Hitler's invasion of Poland, German troops captured the station, allowing the Nazis to communicate with their U-boat fleets and with Japan. At the end of the war, they destroyed it, the detonations of which broke windows of houses over 16 kilometers away. Now covered by forest, amongst the trees it's still possible to find parts of the broadcasting station. In 2018, a three-metre-high monument was unveiled, commemorating the antenna farm of the Transatlantic Radio Telegraph Centre. Now, the Faculty of Electronics at the Military University of Technology in Poland is attempting to reconstruct the transmitter as part of the new museum dedicated to it. You can read more at ampoleagle.com. That's ampoleagle.com. The results are in for the 20th U.S. ARDF Championships and the 11th IARU Region 2 Amateur Radio Direction Finding. Four days of competitions were held October 14th through the 17th in North Carolina, and the results will help determine the makeup of the U.S. ARDF team at the 20th ARDF World Championships, set for summer 2022 in Serbia. The U.S. Championships and the World Championships were rescheduled from 2020 after they had been canceled due to COVID-19 restrictions. Even so, visitors from outside the U.S. were unable to attend this year's competition due to continued travel restrictions, but a hearty group of hopefuls for the U.S. team came ready to compete. Competitors ranged in age from 14 to 74. Competitive events were held in the Burkhead Mountains Wilderness Area, just south of Asheboro, North Carolina. 
Events began on October 14th with Sprint Events, a fast-paced competition in which two sets of five transmitters operating on two different 80-meter frequencies transmit non-consecutive 12-second bursts every minute. Between the transmitters, competitors pass through an open spectator area where supporters and onlookers may cheer them on. Two elite competitors completed the sprint course in just over 15 minutes, a world-class time. Two classic events were held on October 15th. The longer course for the younger adult categories took place on 2 meters, and the shorter course for the older adult and youth categories took place on 80 meters. Separating the longer and shorter course and holding them on separate, non-interfering bands allowed course designs to be tailored for optimum challenge within each competitive category. Foxering, a combination of radio direction finding and classic orienteering on 80 meters, followed the next day. Foxering tests the map and compass navigation skills of the participants. AWRL ARDF co-coordinator Gerald Boyd, WB8WFK, explained, Micropower 80-meter foxes transmitting continuously are placed near marked locations on the map. The transmissions are so weak that competitors' receivers cannot detect them until they arrive very close to the marked locations. Once they can hear one of the transmitters, it is a quick sprint to find the exact location. Competitions concluded on October 17th with a different map and two more classic events, this time with the band swapped for those on the longer and shorter courses. This gives everyone the opportunity to compete on both 2 meter and 80 meters over the two days of competitions. 27 competitors competed in the events. Two standout youth competitors turned in impressive times on adult courses in the women's W19 category, Boyd said. Youths included Adelia Shafroth Craig, 14 years old, of North Carolina, who picked up classic and fox furring golds, and Elizabeth Lisa Afkin, 15 years old, of Massachusetts, who won the sprint gold. U.S. competitors in the 6th IARU age categories for men 19 to 70 and women 19 to 65 are under consideration for membership in the U.S. team for the 2022 ARDF championships. Up to three competitors in each age gender category and competition format may be on the national team. Contact the AWRL ARDF committee for more information on attending, participating in, or hosting ARDF competitions. ARDF competitors do not need an amateur radio license. For more information on amateur radio direction finding, visit the AWRL ARDF website. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. Uh, welcome. Good to see you. FBI has discovered <laughs> that your fridge and your laptop should not be on the same network. This is a hard thing to do for most people, and I'm kind of surprised. This comes from the Portland, Oregon FBI. It's their Tech Tuesday segment. And, uh, hey, far be it for me to say the that we shouldn't be secure in our IoT devices. I just, and I think this is good advice. It's not even bad advice. It's just hard to do. This week, says Tech Tuesday, the FBI, Portland, we're looking at the larger Internet of Things. Everything in your home that connects to the World Wide Web. Okay, I'm going to give them two points off for that because it's not the World Wide Web. It's the Internet. There's a distinction. If you look at the holiday wish list that your kids, spouse, and parents conveniently dropped on you last week at Thanksgiving, I like how you see they make it very, you know, cozy and personal. Most everything on there probably makes the cut, except for the roller skates and the bicycle. But everything else, it's if it's in your house and it connects to the Internet, it is considered a IoT device. I'll say that for them. Digital assistants, yep, check that off. Smart watches, actually that's not strictly true, but... Most smartwatches don't connect directly to the internet. They go through your phone, right? But some have, I guess some have Wi-Fi now. So yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll give them that one. Fitness trackers, definitely not. Again, uh, <laughs> they connect to your phone. Okay. So the FBI, a little unclear on some of these concepts here. Home security devices, again, no. <laughs> Unless they have an internet component, which many don't. 
Thermostats, some of them. You know, the internet-connected ones. Refrigerators, very few, but there are, I believe it or not, refrigerators with internet connections these days. Samsung makes them. They get a browser in them. Even light bulbs, if you have Hue or some other internet-connected light bulbs. Not all of them are. In the case of the Hues, they don't have Wi-Fi in the light bulb. What has the Wi-Fi is the Hue base. But, you know, for all intents and purposes, I guess that's internet-connected. Not World Wide Web connected, but I, uh, add to that all of the fun stuff, writes the FBI. What does the FBI consider fun? Remote controlled robots. Yeah. <laughs> Games and gaming systems. Interactive dolls and talking stuffed animals. Okay. You know, when you pull the string on the thing and it talks to you, doesn't mean it's, in, it's connected to the internet. Lately, there are quite a few, but. Well, says, goes on to say the FBI, the list seems endless. I am not, I, I don't want to diss this. I know I am. But I, the point is, is well taken, even if the details are a little off. What all these all have in common is they send and receive data. But do you know how data is collected and where it's going? Um, that has nothing to do with hackers. Now you're talking privacy, FBI. Now you're talking the Goog. Okay. Another concern. Oh, okay. Here we go. Is that hackers can use that innocent device to do a virtual drive-by of your digital life. Unsecured devices can allow hackers a path into your router. That's accurate. Giving the bad guy access to everything else on your home network that you thought was secure. Oh, this is okay. I'm going to I'm going to rewrite this and send it off to the FBI, but maybe I should just to you explain. And some by the way, some of these some of the I'll give you the advice that they give you, which is actually good. Change the device's factory settings from the default password. You may say, "Well, wait a minute. My my lights don't have a password." Most of these devices in fact don't. But if it's a router, yes, don't use the default password. A simple internet search should tell you how cuz we don't know. And if you can't find the information, consider moving on to another product. Oh, okay. Passwords should be as long as possible and unique for IoT devices. I'm going to, uh, I mean, you can't, if you can log into a device from outside your home, that's when you have to be worried. If you're using your smartphone to log into your Hue lights, that's, that, you don't need to make it as long as possible. And that's not, that's different. Many connected devices are supported by mobile apps on your phone. Yes, these apps could be running in the background and using default permissions you never realized you approved. Know what? This is confusing. Know what kind of personal information these apps are collecting and say no to privilege requests that don't make sense. That has nothing to do with hackers. Just want to say that has nothing to do with hackers. They're kind of mixing things in here. That's privacy. Okay. But it's not bad advice. It's just different. Secure your network. Your fridge and your laptop should not be on the same network. Oh, <laughs> for most, keep your private sensitive data on a separate system from your other IoT devices. So what the apparently the FBI wants you to do is go out and get a separate internet connection, uh, and and have one internet for your wife for your laptop and one internet for your refrigerator. Again, probably not bad advice, but not practical. Make sure all your devices are updated regularly. I agree. Good good thing to say, FBI. If automatic updates are available for software, hardware, and operating systems, turn them on. Turn them on. Let me just um, edit this a little bit and say, here's the deal. Security is hard, but there are a few things you absolutely should do. One is keep your systems up to date. That's really true. And that's one of the reasons we're making such a big deal about Windows 7, because as you probably have heard on this show many times now, Microsoft's going to stop updating Windows 7 come January 14th. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know... That's problematic. In that case, you won't be able to update it. So if you have stuff you can't update, then that's maybe time to move on. That's Then I would agree with the FBI. Maybe time to move on if you cannot update it. Furthermore, if you buy uh, devices that connect to the Internet of any kind, especially IoT devices, doorbells, refrigerators, uh, yeah, I guess, uh, toaster ovens, all of those things should have over-the-air updates available and the manufacturer should be able to push those you shouldn't have to go around to every light bulb in your house and update it no one's going to do that so the real i think the real important thing here is to pick an iot device whatever's connected in your house to the internet that automatically updates you'll you'll update your computer and your phones you, we know you're going to do that 
But there's a lot of other stuff in your house that connects to the internet, and you may not go around and updating that. And that's really important. I'll give you an example. The Ring doorbell. They discovered it's possible, not likely, but if a bad guy came and unscrewed your Ring doorbell from your front door and then connected it, and, you know, got in the car, connected it to a device that he had that he could read your Wi-Fi uh, login and password. Ooh, that's bad. Then put it back on your door, and now he can log into your Wi-Fi as long as he's sitting on the curb out front of your house. So that's a security flaw. But the good news is that Ring, when it learned of this, before it became public, pushed out an update to all the doorbells that they had sold, automatically fixing that problem. That's what you want. You want a device that the manufacturer will, A, be keeping up to date, and B, be regularly pushing updates out to. So if there is a flaw, they can fix it. Because that's the real risk of these IoT devices, that they could become a gateway into your network if they've got a security flaw. And that's something the FBI didn't really <laughs> kind of address here. So that's really important. Don't buy IoT devices that are from companies that aren't big and keeping it up to date. That means a lot of these IoT devices, which come from China, they don't care. They just, you know, and if you've got a internet connected camera in your bedroom and they don't care and they don't update it and they don't, and, you, and the password never was changed because you didn't even know you could, that's not good. Somebody could tune into that from across the internet. That's not so good. So be careful where you get this stuff. If you're getting your stuff from big name companies, Apple, Google, Microsoft, uh, you know, like the Nest, pay attention. Ask me if you're not sure, and I'll tell you, this is a good company. It's updating it. If it's not, don't get it. That's really important. Those are the two big things, updates, really. If you are really advanced and you know how to create... <laughs> a VLAN with, and you have a switch or router in your house that is capable of creating a VLAN, then it would be a good idea to create a separate virtual network for your IoT devices. The number of people who can do that, <laughs> I can count on the fingers of one hand. And I think the FBI suggesting you have a separate internet for your IoT devices just doesn't, I think that's probably not very useful. So there's, there's, it's, uh, this is the problem. Security is hard. Even the Portland FBI doesn't really seem to understand it. You know, I'm sure they got some intern to write this. I hope. But I just thought I'd pass it along. You're going to see the headlines. FBI recommends separate network for your IoT devices. And yeah, that's a good idea. But mm, I don't know if people really know how to do it. The best way to do it is not to have a separate internet, but to have a virtual network that isolates those devices. And that's actually hard to do. You have to have some specialized hardware. All right. Not ragging on the FBI. I They do God's work. Very important. Just want to you know clarify some of the points in that. Good article in Ars Technica, breaking down 5G. And I thought this would be good to pass it along because you're already seeing ads from companies. We won't name names. That 5G is already here in the NFL stadiums. 11 stadiums have 5G in one little corner over by the taco stand, that's it, uh, that some cities have 5G. Well, if it's AT&T, it's not really 5G. It's 5GE, which is really just LTE. So there's a lot of, you know, you don't have a 5G phone unless you're nuts. There are some 5G phones you can buy, not from Apple, but Samsung has one. OnePlus has one, but they're really expensive. And the worst part is when you buy the phone, you're required to sign up for non-existent 5G service at a much higher price. Oh, and your battery life's going to be terrible. So I'm not recommending 5G at this point. But this article and uh, is by Rob Pegararo. And I thank you, Rob, for writing this because it's not long, but it kind of clarifies this whole confusing mess. He starts, the long-touted fifth generation, that's what 5G means, of wireless communications is not magic. <laughs> It'll be nice. But it it's really a, a, a basket of technologies and that's part of the problem. It's 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 you may hear some wonderful things but that is about a particular kind of 5G. It's he says the first thing to know about 5G it's a family affair, sometimes a dysfunctional family affair because there are three different wireless frequencies for 5G and each of them works very differently. There's one, the one most people talk about, the one I usually talk about, millimeter wave 5G. It's at 24 gigahertz. Now your Wi-Fi is at 2.4 gigahertz, 24 gigahertz. That's why it's millimeter wave. It's micro wave. 
And you may know this. One of the reasons it's safe to use your microwave oven is because these very small uh, frequencies, like even 2.4 gigahertz, bounce off of things. A piece of paper, they will bounce off of. A leaf, they will bounce off of. So at 24 gigahertz, you have to be very close to the tower. The tower, they'll need four times the tower density for millimeter wave 5G. And line of sight, and it's not going to go through walls. It probably won't even you know, go through your windows at your office. However, <laughs> it's fast if you can get it 1.2 gigabits. Very low latency, 9, millis 9 to 12 milliseconds. Very much like your landline internet if you had really good internet. That's line of sight, and it was 900 feet from the transmitter. <laughs> so you're, you're not, we're not, no one. Uh -uh. Maybe if you live in a very dense city and you happen to be close to the tower, maybe. And in fact, this will be used in areas like that for uh, home internet, I suspect. So that's that's one flavor and probably not the one you and I are going to get. Then there's the one T-Mobile already just launched at 600 megahertz, much, much longer frequencies. That travels great through walls and stuff, but it's not that much faster. Uh, Sprint, then there's this, that's low band. Then there's mid band, which Sprint's launched uh, at 2.5 gigahertz. That's the same as LTE. That's the same as close to Wi-Fi. So lower f speed, but it'll travel better. And you'll probably get 100 megabits, which is pretty good. I mean, you'd everybody would be happy with that. Although I have to point out, I, you know, on a good day with a good carrier and not too congested a cell site, I get 100 megabits on my on Verizon, AT&T, some of these others, on, on LTE. So this is the problem. It's so, you see, I already I'm confused. There's three bands, millimeter wave, medium wave, and low band, as they call it. AT&T is starting to launch the low band. <laughs> Oh, and another thing I might point out, they just did a study, I think it was, was it the, the FCC? Government agency did a study of, of carriers' coverage maps, you know, those beautiful pink and red glowing maps that you see on their websites, and said, yeah, not so much. That's, <laughs> I don't want to use the word lie, but you might. It's not exactly what you're going to get. So don't look at the coverage maps and go, honey, let's get a 5G phone. We're right smack dab in the middle. You might not be. In fact, this whole thing is a, it's a bit off, a bit of a ways off. So I'm just going to mention that. Anyway, I'm glad you were here, and I'm here, and I'll be here next week, and I hope you'll come by and bring your friends, too, as we talk high tech. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here on This Week in amateur radio. A few months back during the QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo, Mike Ritz, W7VO, who is ARRL's Northwestern Division Director, did a presentation on the history of the ham radio call sign. Every legal amateur radio operator in the world has a unique call sign assigned by their government, and many of us are better known by our call signs than by our names. But how did call signs for radio amateurs come into being in the first place? Mike offered a little history during his presentation. Prior to 1912, there were no wireless regulations in the U.S. at all. It was free range. U.S. amateur stations made up their own call signs, first with their names, then later shortened to one to three letters or numbers or some combination of them. Commercial and government-owned stations also made up their own call signs with the same one to three letters, so there was a lot of overlap. Spark gap transmitters and the crude receivers at the time really had limited range, so it really didn't matter too much. Mike Ritz, W7VO, had a lot more to say about ham radio history and the history of call signs in particular. His presentation is available on YouTube. It's History of the Ham Radio Call Sign. The 3Y0J Bouvet Island de Expedition Team says that with its first deposit on its contract to have the SS Marama provide transportation to Bouvet, it has confirmed its plans to activate the second most wanted DXCC entity in November 2022. 
It is a huge task and undertaking to go to Bouvet, and we still critically need additional upfront support to close the budget, said the Amateur Radio D-Expeditions team of co-leaders Ken Opskar, LA-7GIA, Run Oye, LA-7THA, and Erwan Marion, LB-1QI. The D-Expedition announced that two more operators will join the adventure, taking the number 213. Dave Jorgensen, WD5COV, is an avid DXer and experienced D-Expeditioner. He is vice president of the Intrepid DX Group, which had hoped to mount a D-Expedition to Bouvet before its plans broke down. The second new team member, identified as Peter, is described as an experienced captain and expedition leader. Peter has experience in offshore, uncharted, and remote polar sailing, and he specializes in supporting some of the most complex expeditions in the Arctic and Antarctica. He will oversee the Zodiac landings and serve as a digital mode operator. Our preparation for Bouvet includes planning, constructing, and testing a system for landing Zodiacs safely, and this will be tested in rough seas in Norway before and after Christmas, the 3Y0J team said in its news release. We plan for safely landing the Zodiacs in different manners, also with some swell, unmanned, and with less risk for operators. And we prepare for the event that Zodiacs are capsizing, and we still can retrieve the equipment. We have done the first prelim sea trials of the Zodiac equipment in Norway, and will continue sea trials to further mature the concept. According to the announcement, the team plans to use a gasoline engine-powered winch to lift equipment up a cliff to the operating site. This will also be tested in Norway. We plan to access the 25-foot cliff with professional means and, if needed, prepare for climbing and bolting a short route to gain access. The D-Expedition has secured the services of experts having a lot of experience at and around Bouvet Island. With all these upcoming events and the knowledge in the extended team, rest assured this will be a well-planned and well-executed project, the team said. Follow the D-Expedition team's plans from its website and the 3Y0J Facebook page. In our last installment, we saw how the FCC shifted from an initial VHF-UHF band plan that was radically different from today's allocations to a proposal which closely parallels the frequencies we have today. Amateurs were happier with the January 1945 plan over the November 1944 one as it restored our 10 meter band back where it belonged and gave us a full four mega cycles at six meters. One person who was not happy with the January 1945 plan was Edwin Armstrong, inventor of the regenerative, super regenerative and super heterodyne receivers and the father of FM. He wanted the FM broadcast band to stay in the 42 to 50 mega cycle area. Instead, he suddenly saw it transferred up to 84 to 102 mega cycles which would make every FM station and receiver obsolete. He knew that David Sarnoff of RCA was behind this, as RCA wanted television in the frequencies now occupied by FM. Sarnoff and the RCA engineers had an interesting argument. FM, they said, should be moved higher in frequency to avoid the sporadic E skip. Armstrong fought back. He pointed out that FM, due to its capture effect, was less susceptible to skip interference than television, which used AM for the video carrier. He ran tests and submitted data showing that the skip interference to FM would be far less than imagined and certainly a fraction of what TV would endure. The ARRL, by the way, was in favor of moving FM up to the 84 to 102 megacycle area. To counteract the arguments that FM receivers would become obsolete by the move, QST in the May 1945 issue ran the schematic of a one-tube converter which Hallicrafters said they could build for $5.60. In late May 1945, the FCC announced the three alternatives that were being considered for the disputed 44 through 108 megacycle region. They were, in alternative number one, 44 to 48 megacycles. Amateur, we would have a 7 meter band under this proposal. 48 to 50 megacycles, facsimile broadcasting. 
50 to 54 megacycles, educational FM broadcasting, 54 to 68 megacycles, commercial FM broadcasting, 68 to 74 megacycles, TV channel 1, 74 to 78 megacycles, aeronautical fixed and mobile, and 78 to 108 megacycles, TV channels 2 through 6. Alternative number 2 was as follows. 44 to 56 megacycles, TV channels 1 and 2. 56 to 60, the amateur 5-meter band. 60 to 66, TV channel 3. 66 to 68, facsimile broadcasting. 68 to 72, educational FM broadcasting. 72 to 86, commercial FM broadcasting. 86 to 104, TV channels 4 through 6. And 104 through 108 megacycles would be non-government fixed and mobile. In alternative number 3, the proposed allocations were as follows. 44 to 50 megacycles, TV channel 1. 50 to 54, amateur 6 meter band. 54 to 84, TV channels 2 through 6. 84 through 88, educational FM broadcasting. 88 through 102, commercial FM broadcasting. 102 through 104, facsimile broadcasting, and 104 through 108 megacycles, non-government fixed and mobile. Except for the 44 through 108 megacycle region, which was still up in the air, the 25 through 44 megacycles and frequencies above 108 megacycles were fairly well established at today's allocations. The only major exception was the 470 through 480 megacycle band, which was still allocated to facsimile broadcasting. The FCC indicated that tests would be run throughout the summer months to determine which alternative was the best. Reaction was quick to the proposals. Except for the ARRL, almost none of the major players liked alternative number two, so the choice lay between one and three. The ARRL found number two acceptable because it preserved our five meter band. Of the other two alternatives, the ARRL was strongly opposed to number one. A 44 through 48 megacycle, seven meter band would have too much skip, was too close to our 10 meter band, and too far from two meters. In the end, the ARRL came out in favor of alternative number three because it was believed that the FM band should be as far as possible from our ham bands in order to avoid IF interference to FM receivers. Naturally, Major Armstrong was in favor of alternative number one. He continued to make extensive tests and bombarded the FCC with the results. However, Armstrong never realized that the political clout of General Sarnoff and RCA could overcome any test results. The Major thought he had the summer to complete his tests. Instead, on June 27, 1945, the FCC decided on alternative number three, with a few minor changes to bring the allocations in line with what we have today. FM was definitely at 88 through 108 megacycles, and amateurs had a new 6-meter band at 50 to 54 megacycles, nestled snug between TV channels 1 and 2. Armstrong was stunned, but he didn't give up. As late as 1947, he was still submitting data to the FCC in regards to the effect of skip on FM broadcasts, but it was too late. For a period of time, there were two FM broadcast bands as stations in the new 88 through 108 megacycle allocation coexisted with the older ones between 42 to 50 megacycles. But by 1947, the old FM band was a memory and sat waiting for Channel 1 to take over. However, a new controversy was brewing. With thousands of amateurs on our new 6-meter band and thousands of TVs pouring out of mostly RCA factories, a new concept was entering the amateur language, TVI. In our next installment, we will look at the TV wars of the 1940s and why ARRL wanted Channel 2 instead of Channel 1 eliminated. So, until then, I hope your 6-meter QSOs aren't causing interference to the Texaco Star Theater. The Australian Communications and Media Authority Amateur Radio Office has been receiving a high volume of requests for the newly available 2x1 contest call signs. The ACMA says the processing time for exam and call sign applications is now 15 business days. 
Use of the new call signs starts November 1st for contests only. At this point, each call sign is valid for one year. All 26 VK3 Prefix 2x1 call signs were snapped up quickly. Demand was lower in other call areas. A database of 2x1 call signs is available. The contest call sign template comprises the usual VK prefix with the addition of VJ and VL also being available. The contest call signs are issued under the following rules. Issued exclusively for amateur radio contests, limited to amateur radio clubs and holders of an amateur operator certificate of proficiency, advanced, limited to one 2x1 call sign per license station, not including repeater or beacon licenses, Successful 2x1 call sign applicants are not required to obtain a new license or vary an existing license. 2x1 call signs will be issued for a period of 12 months. Call signs will be allocated on a first-come, first-served basis. The allocation process commenced on October 13, 2021 by the Australian Maritime College, who are responsible for assessments and call sign issue in Australia on behalf of the Australian Communications and Media Authority. How do members of the world CW organizations communicate best with one another when they don't have their fist on the keyers or bugs? They unite as the International CW Council, a platform for CW clubs around the world. The council just launched its MET website this month, using it to amplify their voice to promote and expand Morse code as a mode of communication between amateur radio operators. Howard Bernstein, WB2UZE of the Long Island CW Club, said that it all began at a meeting he held with 23 CW enthusiasts in January of 2021. They all saw a need for a greater cooperation and collaboration for clubs they represented. The 22 currently affiliated clubs include many familiar names. The Long Island CW Club, CW Ops, SKCC, FISTS, NAQCC, K1USN, and the A1 Club of Japan. The Council has already been hard at work on opportunities for support and partnerships. For example, the CW Ops Giving Back program for on-air coaching doubled in participation through the joint efforts of ICWC. For more information about the Council and to find out about current developments, please visit their website at www.internationalcwcouncil, that's all one word, dot org. Tad Cook, K7RA in Seattle, reports sunspot activity was up this past week with the average daily sunspot number increasing nearly fivefold from 11.3 to 54.9. Average daily solar flux was nearly 76 over the week and the solar flux peaked on October 27th at 110.9. Tamitha Scove, WX6SWW, the space weather woman, says some seriously stormy space weather is in the offing as we enter the traditional fall and winter contest season. You could be see some, seeing some storming easily in through Monday of next week, possibly into Tuesday, or, um, you know, if you're at mid-latitudes, likely, you know, we might see it uh, die down by the first, by the Monday. But again, these, there's a chance that more solar storms will be launched, right? We have a chance for more flaring and more solar storms. So don't keep, don't take your eyes off the sun simply because we do have a storm coming, okay? Because uh, it, it, we could get more. So this, uh, obviously, this forecast would change quite quickly at that point. That's the inevitable Tamitha Scove, WX6SWW, with her take on space weather. Her videos are available on YouTube. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. And now with a little more detail on the upcoming CME and Solar Flare event this weekend, we go to Steve Richards, G4HPE, from the Southgate Amateur Radio News. Quite a lot is happening in outer space, as the sun appears to be really ramping up its activity. We've been warned of potentially major solar disruption to communications here on Earth. There was a global eruption on the sun last Thursday, the 28th. It started with a powerful X1-class solar flare from sunspot group AR2887. The blast created a massive tsunami of plasma in the sun's atmosphere, which rippled right across the entire solar disk. 
And so, as predicted, a coronal mass ejection launched into space on October the 28th by the exploding sunspot. And as I write, we're anticipating some ionospheric chaos as the CME is heading almost directly for Earth. The SOHO spacecraft, which watches the sun for us, has produced coronagraphs which record the CME racing away from the sun faster than 1,260 kilometers per second. That's 2.8 million miles per hour. There's an amazing SOHO video at spaceweather.com, which is always the best place to find information about the sun's mad moments. The movie of the sun is full of snow speckles caused by solar protons striking the coronagraph's CCD camera. These particles were accelerated towards the spacecraft and also towards Earth by shock waves in the leading edge of the coronal mass ejection. Travelling at incredible speeds, the protons reached the Earth in less than one hour. The CME itself will take more than two days to travel from the Sun to the Earth. The estimated day of arrival is sometime on October the 30th. So, an email has just arrived from the British Geological Survey, which institutes a geomagnetic storm watch for October the 30th, with the possibility of strong G3-class geomagnetic storms. Such storms can spark naked-eye auroras as far south as 50 degrees geomagnetic latitude, and photographic auroras at even lower latitudes. Lesser G1 and G2 class storms could persist throughout Halloween, as Earth passes through the coronal mass ejections wake. If you're interested in keeping appraised of what the Sun is up to, you can go to spaceweather.com and sign up to receive solar flare alerts by SMS. Time now for the AMSAT report. Several distance records were submitted this week on AO109, a distance of 2,001.33 kilometers, was claimed by John K8YSE and Glenn AA5PK. On PO101, Jerome F4DXV and Juan A65GC claimed a distance of 5,256 kilometers. It is challenging to set a distance record. First, both stations have to be very close to LOS or loss of signal, meaning close to the horizon for each station. Both stations have to be on opposite sides of the satellite's footprint. Then you have to hope that both of you can hear each other adequately enough to exchange information. Sometimes this time is less than 30 seconds and you do not get another chance for quite some time. When everything lines up just perfectly and you make that contact, you can earn a new distance record. The AMSAT report comes to us each week courtesy of Bruce Page, KK5DO. The East Coast Amateur Radio Service Incorporated, or ECARS, has announced that it can provide financial support for worthy amateur radio related initiatives. The focus of this grant program is to support amateur radio and other nonprofit organizations with programs to educate, license, and otherwise support amateur radio activities with emphasis on youth-based projects, ECARS said. ECARS routinely supports scholarship grants through the ARRL Foundation and has awarded other grants to organizations for youth programs or for emergency assistance. We actually get far fewer requests than we have expected from this program, said ECARS President Vic Klein, WA4THR. Information on applying for an ECARS grant is on the organization's website, Preference is also given to requests that benefit the ECARS service area and to groups IRS 501c3 tax-exempt organizations. Grant funds are budgeted for this purpose each year from the ECARS general operating funds or from donations specifically earmarked for the grant fund. The Board of Directors reviews applications quarterly with awards announced in the first month of the next quarter. Evaluation of received grant applications is scheduled for March 15th, June 15th, September 15th, and December 15th. Organizations selected will receive a check that is to be applied toward the purpose described in the application with a report to follow to eCARS that indicates how the funds were used and the results of the program. Voters are welcome, and eCARS will assume that they represent authorization to publish. The ARRL Foundation will start accepting applications for its 2022 scholarship program on November 1st. With more on the Foundation's scholarship program and on how you can apply, we go to Steve Richards, G4HPE, reporting from Southgate Amateur Radio News. 
The submission deadline is December the 31st. More than 100 scholarships, ranging from $500 to $25,000, will be awarded in 2022. All applicants must be licensed radio amateurs. Active non-US radio amateurs are eligible for scholarships sponsored by the Amateur Radio Digital Communications Organization. Many scholarships have specific requirements, such as intended area of study or residence within a particular ARRL division, a section or state, and also based on license class. Some scholarships require additional documentation, such as letters of recommendation. The ARRL Foundation will be utilising a new scholarship management platform for the 2022 ARRL Foundation scholarships. Applicants no longer choose specific scholarships, but will be matched with all scholarships for which they qualify. Transcripts and any additional required documents must be submitted with the application, not emailed separately as was done in the past. Applications without accompanying transcripts and applicable required documentation will not be considered. The AWRL Foundation Scholarship Committee will review all applicants and scholarship recipients will be notified in May 2022 via USPS mail and also via email. For more information, visit the AWRL Foundation Scholarship Program. EDN is an electronics community for engineers by engineers. Writing on their interesting website, John Dunn describes the cause of flutter or rapid fading on AM broadcast signals. In the United States, John sometimes likes to listen to a couple of AM radio stations that transmit from southern New Jersey, which is rather a long way from his home on Long Island, New York. Their signals are pretty strong during the daytime, but now and then there is a rapid in and out fading effect, which sounds very much like a flutter. Noting that he had sometimes heard that same effect when listening to shortwave radio, John initially assumed that it was an ionospheric phenomenon, but now he believes there is an alternative explanation. Consider yourself listening to one AM radio station coming in from quite a distance, while at the same time there's another station transmitting on the same assigned frequency, also lots of miles away, but in a different direction versus the first station. Although assigned to the same station frequency, the actual carrier frequencies of each station might be ever so slightly different, perhaps only by a few hertz. This is still well within legal limits, but the stations are not exactly on the same frequency. If the two frequencies were exactly the same, and their waves happen to arrive exactly in phase with each other, you could probably hear the audio being transmitted by both stations at the same time. However, if the two incoming signals were slightly different in frequency, what we commonly call out of phase, there would be some net signal attenuation. And even more strikingly, if the two carrier frequencies were only very slightly different, the two signals would alternatively cycle by cycle, first reinforce and then cancel at a rate which would be related to the difference between the two frequencies. The incoming signals reinforce, then oppose, then reinforce, then oppose, and so on, causing the acoustic effect that could be called flutter. Radio hams would call this rapid QSB, or rapid fading. If the frequencies of the two transmitters start to drift further apart, the flutter speed increases until it becomes an audible tone, and if you keep on going, it turns into an audible squeal, which is often called a heterodyne squeal, a sound very familiar to shortwave listeners and ham radio operators using amplitude modulation communications instead of single sideband. Well, you can read John's full article with some very helpful explanatory diagrams at www.edn.com. Look out for the article entitled AM Radio Flutter. Foundations of Amateur Radio As you might know, I consider myself a contester. I derive great pleasure from getting on air and making noise during a contest. It gives me a wonderful opportunity to test my station, hone my skills and work on learning something new every time I participate. Due to circumstances, I've been away from contesting for a number of years, but recently I was able to scratch my itch from my own shack. For 24 glorious hours, I was able to make contacts from the comfort of my home, being able to make a cup of tea, eat some dinner, stay warm, catch a nap when the bands were closed and generally have a blast. My setup worked well. Operating QRP or low power, I used a basic contest logger, since I wasn't expecting to be making many contacts. To automatically call CQ, I recorded my voice and set up a script that played the audio, waited 4 seconds, then played it again. 
Using my audio mixer, I could turn that on and off at will, and between that and the headset I was wearing, I had loads of fun and even made contacts. During the last three hours of the contest, my partner came home. After hearing me attempt to confirm an exchange for a while, it became apparent that making exchanges, calling CQ and generally talking out loud was going to be an issue in our home, since my shack is within hearing range of the entire house. That or I'm going deaf and my voice is getting louder. I do get excited from time to time. For the past several months I've been trying to find a solution, and until today I wasn't getting any closer. I didn't think I was asking for too much. I am looking for a contest logger that runs on Linux, that has the SuperCheck partial database, knows the contest rules, and most importantly has a voice gear with the ability to actually voice the exchange itself. As in, not a pre-recorded audio file, but the ability to speak any call sign and any exchange. As an aside, the SuperCheck partial database is a list of frequently heard contest call signs, originally introduced by Ken Kilo One Echo Alpha which, if used properly, helps you when you're deciphering a call sign on a noisy band. Using it to guess calls and make mistakes can result in significant penalties for some contests. The only tool I've come across that does all this in any way is N1MM. It runs on Windows, and I have to tell you the idea of having to buy a new computer just to run a supported version of Windows just doesn't do it for me. N1MM also doesn't use Hamlib, so my radio needs to be physically connected to the computer. I won't bore you with my weeks of attempts, but it became farcical. During my months of exploration, I looked at and tried plenty of other tools. Many of them aren't intended for contesting, don't have access to the SuperCheck partial database, don't do voice keying, don't run under Linux, require weird bits of extra software, have little or no documentation, and a myriad of other issues like having to compile from source with arcane library requirements. The list goes on. One contender that got close was a text-only tool called TLF. It got so close that I almost used it for my previous contest. In the end, I didn't because it was doing unpredictable things with the display and I had to write my own contest rule file for an unsupported contest, which I couldn't test in time to actually use. Today, I took another look. TLF doesn't have a voice keyer on board, but it does have the ability to interface with a Morse keyer, which is interesting since it implies that there is a process that translates call signs and messages typed in with a keyboard into Morse, which might mean that it may be possible to pretend to be a Morse key and make voice sounds instead. The Morse keyer software in question is CW Demon. It accepts text messages from TLF and then converts those into Morse code, and then directly controls your radio to generate dits and dars on air. I started digging through the source code when I realized that CW Demon might have a debug mode that shows what it's doing. Turns out, not only does it have a debug option, you can also prevent it from keying your radio, which means that I should be able to get TLF to generate the messages, CW Demon to show those messages, and me to do something useful, like play audio files as appropriate. If I pull this off, it will mean that I can operate my station as if I'm running CW, but the radio will be transmitting voice, which makes for a beautiful way to save my vocal cords whilst running a contest without bothering anyone else, and do this without needing to install Windows, which, frankly, in my book, is a win. If I succeed and I think the odds are good, I'll publish my efforts on my GitHub repository for you to use, if you're so inclined. I have to confess, when I started this adventure, I was not at all convinced that I could make this happen, and at all but thrown in the towel. It's still quite unbelievable to me that this kind of thing doesn't appear to exist, but if all goes well, it should soon. What are you going to be doing for your next contest? I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. The federal government is accepting applications until November 10th for a telecommunications specialist to work at the FCC's High Frequency Direction Finding Facility in Columbia, Maryland. This is a full-time position and no travel is required. The individual hired will perform watch duty and serve as a technical authority for communication system users in resolving radio interference complaints and problems, among other responsibilities. 
This position requires U.S. citizenship, a security clearance, and educational transcripts. Anyone hired to fill this position would be required to be vaccinated against COVID-19 and submit documentation of proof of vaccination. A resume is considered an integral part of the process to determine if an applicant meets the basic qualifications for the position and if the applicant is among the best qualified. To learn more and to apply, visit the USA Jobs website. Meanwhile, the ARRL, the National Association for Amateur Radio, is hiring for these positions at its headquarters in Newington, Connecticut. Qualified candidates are invited to email their cover letter and resume to ARRL Human Resources. Visit the ARRL Employment Opportunities page for more information. The league is looking to fill the following positions. Lab Engineer, EMC slash RFI Specialist, Administrative Assistant, Director of Information Technology, Marketing Communications Associate, Public Relations and Outreach Manager, and Social Media Strategist. To apply to any of these positions, submit your resume and cover letter by mail, email, or fax to the ARRL Human Resources Department, 225 Main Street, Newington, Connecticut, 06111. Fax number is 860-594-0298. ARRL is an equal opportunity employer. An experienced and successful member of the Amateur Radio Contesting and DX community lost his life on October 21st as the result of a small plane crash. William Will Roberts, AA4NC of Apex, North Carolina, was piloting the plane, which went down not long after takeoff in a wooded area of Onslow County, North Carolina, near the Holly Ridge Topsail Island Airport, killing Roberts and another passenger identified as Willie Hobbs Jr. Two children were hospitalized with injuries. Roberts, 61, was the owner of the Mooney M20J aircraft and held a commercial pilot's license. A licensed radio amateur since 1976, Roberts became interested early on in contesting and DXing and enjoyed being on the DX end of the pileup, as he said in his QRZ.com profile. Over the years, Roberts operated from many locations, including some in South and Central America and others in more exotic locales. He was a regular at the Dayton Hamvention. He was on the DXCC honor roll, had achieved nine band DXCC on HF, and VUCC on 6 meters. He also enjoyed RTTY. AA4NC took part regularly in events like the ARRL 160 meter contest and ARRL November sweepstakes. He participated in the first World Radio Sport Team Championship event in 1990 in Seattle and served as a judge at WRTC 2018 in Germany. A member of the Potomac Valley Radio Club, Roberts was the trustee of W4MR, used occasionally in contests from his home contest station. Roberts was also a guitarist and vocalist who played solo acoustic shows in the coastal Carolinas and belonged to the Flying Musicians Association. A graduate of North Carolina State University, Roberts was an electrical engineer specializing in telecommunications. Investigators from the National Transportation Safety Board were on the scene of the crash to determine its cause. On October 14th, the Straight Key Century Club enrolled its 25,000 member as part of the Florida Island Hoppers Amateur Radio Club. W4USI Club Trustee Bill Clark, W3SI, who has been an individual member for over a year, said that he is excited to have his club join by far the friendliest, most active group I have ever been with. Now, as they activate U.S. Islands, the club can also issue their membership number. The Straight Key Century Club was founded in 2006 to promote and preserve the art of manual sending with straight keys, bugs, and side swipers. Membership quickly spread from North America to Europe, Oceania, and Asia. Members can earn various awards as well as participate in sprints and other contests. The club welcomes new and returning CW operators with an overriding philosophy of always being considerate regarding the other operator's speed and skill. 
Membership in the Straight Key Century Club is free and open to operators of all skill levels. They provide a good place to get your CW feet wet, as well as a fun place to hone your skills on mechanical keys. For more information and to join, please visit their website at www.skccgroup.com. A team of 135 radio amateurs from four states supported medical teams volunteering for the Bank of America Chicago Marathon on October 10th. The Chicago Marathon is the third largest marathon in the world. This marked the 13th year that the amateur radio volunteers have partnered with the marathon medical team to help coordinate the responses, arrange for the deployment of medical supplies, and provide situational awareness for the organizers. The largely flat marathon course has 28 stations on its 26.2 mile course, each with a medical tent. Hams are deployed at each medical tent to support communication for the medical teams. There are two main communication nets, a medical net and a logistics net, and nine repeaters support these nets. Most of the repeaters belong to local clubs, but five temporary repeaters are also deployed. In addition to passing urgent medical health and welfare traffic, ham radio volunteers also provide situational awareness for race organizers, such as updating the number of individuals under care at each medical tent. Hams at each medical tent are also responsible for changing the event alert flag, which informs runners of course conditions so they can adjust their pace. This year, the flags were changed to red because of humidity and increased potential for serious heat-related injuries. Most communication is done via FM repeaters. If a runner develops a problem, spotters alert a rapid response medical team, each with a ham volunteer to handle communication. In serious situations, hams can call into the forward command post to dispatch medical assistance. Ten ham volunteers in forward command serve as net controls, traffic handlers, logging specialists, and expediters. The event provides plenty of personal challenges. Many ham volunteers report to their duty stations very early in the morning to conduct roll calls at 6 a.m., and many remain on the course until the event ends at around 4 p.m. The hams and medical teams must adjust to the weather as well. Hams also serve the aid stations where race volunteers dispense water and Gatorade. In the event of an emergency, hams shadow the aid station captain to facilitate communication with the forward command. Even in an area of ubiquitous cell phones, ham radio remains able to provide an independent resource that can back up all other communication. The administration of the Threesar District in Kerala, India, sought the service of radio amateurs to support communications during disaster relief operations in the wake of incessant rain and resultant flooding that disrupted lives across central Kerala, the Economic Times has reported. The hams have set up stations in the district to overcome the possibility that conventional telecommunications may fail. Communication turns out to be a major challenge when natural calamities strike, Sarah Condren, VU2SCV told the Press Trust of India News Agency. During heavy floods, there are chances that the power supply will be down for days, which will affect the communication systems, including the mobile phones. Sarah Condren, a former Merchant Navy officer, was one of 10 operators volunteering to help the Threesir administration to handle emergency communication. CNN reported that at least 27 people were killed after heavy rain triggered floods and landslides in southern India. According to their report, torrential rain in mid-October caused rivers to swell and flooded roads, leaving vehicles submerged in muddy water. Some houses were reduced to rubble, CNN reported. Ham radio volunteers have been recruited to assist during previous natural disasters in India, including an August 2018 flood that ravaged Kerala state. Sarah Condren recounted that during the August 2018 event, as the state flooded and power outages affected communication, the district administration sought the assistance of radio amateurs. This is November 3, Victor Echo Mike with your month ending Parks on the Air update. Be sure to visit parksontheair.com for more information about the program and poda.app for spotting, park information, leaderboards, and more. Low CQ, low CQ, CQ Poda, CQ Parks on the Air. And now in Parks on the Air news. In September, POTA welcomed Brazil and Norway to the program, which means we now have parks in 102 different DXCC entities. Activators in Brazil can now choose from over 700 different parks to activate, while activators in Norway, which is rich with nature reserves, have more than 2,500 parks to choose from. In POTA events, 
Coming up on October 16th and 17th is the Autumn Support Your Parks event. This is a great opportunity to get out for a low-key weekend activity and make some contacts before the weather turns cold or for our friends in the Southern Hemisphere as the seasons start to warm up. In our last item of POTA news, we're excited to announce that September of 2021 was an all-time record-setting month for POTA, with more than a quarter of a million contacts made in one month. Although logs are still coming in, the CUSO count is currently at 263,478. And now for our monthly stats update. As we mentioned during our news item, September was the biggest month ever for Parks on the Air. During the month, there were over 250,000 contacts made by about 1,500 activators. These activators put nearly 3,500 Parks on the Air from 27 different DX entities. The top activators for the month were K4NYM with 3,378 QSOs and KU8T who activated 61 different parks. The top hunter for the month was KZ4KX with 1,270 QSOs while hunting 943 different parks. In our POTA DX corner, Japan was the most active entity outside of North America with 3,779 QSOs being made in September. Not to be outdone, however, we had quite a bit of activity from Canada, Alaska, Puerto Rico, England, Wales, France, and many other entities. The top DX activators outside of North America for the month were MW0GWG with 978 QSOs and JF7RJM who activated 30 parks. This concludes our September 2021 Parks on the Air update. As always, the team at Parks on the Air wishes you safe activations and happy hunting. 73. And now, with his segment on tower climbing and antenna safety, here is Arizona's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. Hey, guess what? I can't see the VU meter for where I am, so I'm going to have to just kind of wing it. I wanted to do a segment for this series while working on a tower, but as usual, Mother Nature changed my mind. So here we are again from the comfy confines of good old Studio B. As winter sets in where you live, we're often reminded of those nasty little chores we put off all summer up on our ham towers, and I'm no exception to this rule. I always put off for winter what could be more easily done during the summer. The fall is actually a good time for tower work. In many parts of the USA, there are predictable dry spells during the change of seasons. The slowing of grass and weeds gives us a good chance to inspect the tower base bolts, clamps, and any grounding hardware. This is also a good time for spraying a good amount of herbicide around tower bases, grounding systems, fences, guy anchors, and other tower parts. It's also a good time to look down on the ground around the base of the tower for any parts that may have broken off during the summer storms that you may have not noticed from a distance. It's a good idea to always keep the tower base area free from debris and junk, so anything falling from the tower is immediately visible. Tell the person that mows the grass to always watch for stuff on the ground. Keep it picked up and report anything he finds on the ground. A clean gravel ground cover around the tower base is in your best interest as a tower owner or tower user. So go outside tomorrow and clean up everything around the base of the tower. Make sure everyone else that works around the tower does the same thing. This is one of the best ways to notice problems before they appear on the radio waves. This is the season for a final trip up the tower for a pre-winter inspection of the antennas, feed lines, waterproofing, and of the tower hardware too. Take the basic tower work tools, antenna work tools, and coax installing, securing, and waterproofing items too. Take your time and check every clamp, every coax connection on all sides. Jiggle everything with your hand to inspect for tightness. Be careful not to grab any active antennas while doing your annual inspection. It is not uncommon for things to vibrate loose during the year, and this may be your last chance to climb for months or more. So take care of it before winter's worst weather gets here. Sometimes that last climb of the year is during light rain or wind. I'll climb during some wind, but prefer not to. Sometimes I don't have a choice. If you're a once a year climber and have never gone up in a stout wind and are easily made seasick, you may want to reconsider climbing in the wind. On an unguide, self-supporting tower in the wind, the tower sways around, which causes you to feel dizzy and wobbly. When you're on the tower, above the tree line, there are no references around you to let you know that you're moving. 
that since the tower and you are both swaying at the same rate, well, the tower may actually be swaying several inches, it looks like you're sitting perfectly still. This optical illusion can make your head spin or feel dizzy. If you're used to it, this, there's no problem. But if you're easily made nauseated and you're only holding onto the tower with your hands, it could cost you your life if you suddenly had to vomit while climbing. So if you're the kind of person who gets motion sickness easily, you may want to avoid climbing during winds more than a gentle breeze. Just be patient and wait for better weather. Remember, tower work at any height can easily become deadly. Clear, sober minds must be in charge. Money spent on books, videos, and climbing gear is well worth the investment. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. The Register website carries an interesting article about a common technology which many of us use. Bluetooth is a wireless technology operating at around 2.45 GHz that uses radio signals to share data over a short distance, eliminating the need for wires. You can use Bluetooth on your mobile devices to share documents or to connect with other Bluetooth-enabled devices. It has a range of about 9 meters. Devices connected by Bluetooth are generally thought to be secure and safe against hacking. This is because they operate on many different spot frequencies and the devices hop between these frequencies hundreds of times a second. Over the past few years, mobile devices have become increasingly chatty over the Bluetooth Low Energy Protocol, known as BLE, but this turns out to be a somewhat significant privacy risk. Seven scientists at the University of California, San Diego, tested the BLE implementations on several popular phones, PCs and gadgets, and found that they can be tracked through their physical signalling characteristics, albeit they emit with intermittent success. But that means your devices may be emitting a unique fingerprint, meaning it's possible to look out for those fingerprints in multiple locations to figure out where those devices have been and when. This could be used to track people. You'll have to use your imagination to determine who would or could usefully exploit this. That said, some of the members of the scientific team believe it's worth product makers addressing this privacy weakness. The academics describe their findings in a paper called Evaluating Physical Layer BLE Location Tracking Attacks on Mobile Devices which is scheduled to be presented at the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers Symposium on Security and Privacy in 2022. Bluetooth transmissions have become more common in phones, laptops, watches and the like, thanks to operating system support for services like Apple's Continuity Protocol for moving work across devices and Find My, which is used for locating lost devices. More recently, the US-based researchers explain, software for tracking COVID-19 has used mobile devices as Bluetooth beacons, continually broadcasting signals in the service of public health. Applications utilizing Bluetooth commonly try to conceal identifying data by doing things like re-encrypting the MAC address of the transmitting device. But this sort of MAC address randomization can't conceal baked-in hardware characteristics that may be usable to uniquely identify the transmitting machine. The scientists looked at a handful of popular mobile devices. The iPhone X, ThinkPad X1 Carbon, the MacBook Pro 2016, Apple Watch 4, Google Pixel 5, and the Bose QuietComfort 35 wireless headphones, and they found that they could quite successfully fingerprint the physical Bluetooth chip layer. In other words, they measured variations in the radio frequency characteristics of Bluetooth transmissions in a way that allowed them to distinguish one device from another, making identified devices theoretically trackable. Radio frequency fingerprinting has been the subject of academic research for years on systems such as Bluetooth and Wi-Fi and RFID. The University of California group claims that no one has previously evaluated how practical a fingerprinting attack on Bluetooth might be in the real world, and that no one has previously proposed a Bluetooth fingerprinting tool that can measure the physical layer imperfections exposed by such systems' transmissions. The Bluetooth chipsets in the sample devices share a common architectural pattern. They include Wi-Fi circuitry to reduce power consumption and to save space. As a result, both Bluetooth and Wi-Fi in these devices rely on the same 2.4 GHz in-phase quadrature receiver hardware design. 
A consequence of this is that they share the same hardware imperfections. The imperfections are introduced by the shared front-end chipset. They result in two measurable metrics in Bluetooth and Wi-Fi transmissions, carrier frequency offset and encoding imperfections. And this is your personal fingerprint, so be careful who you show it to. You can find out more at www.theregister.com and we thank Stephen Golf 7 Victor Foxtrot Yankee for digging out this item. And Stephen, we know where you are. Watch those band edges. With the CQ Worldwide Single Sideband Contest this weekend, it's an appropriate time to remind some phone contesters to pay attention to band edges. If you're operating near the upper or lower band margins, or near the limits of your operating privileges, be aware that your signal's bandwidth may extend beyond the frequency displayed on your radio. For example, if your radio reads 7.125 MHz on lower sideband phone, your signal will extend outside the U.S. phone band and into the CW portion of the band. In the quick pace and excitement of a contest, it's easy to lose track of upper and lower band edges, as well as your license privileges. It's always best to review the amateur allocations before a contest and to keep a hard copy at hand. If using spotting assistance, be aware that operators in other countries often have frequency allocations that differ from those in the U.S., and they may not spot stations on frequency that are off-limits for U.S. amateurs. Always check that the frequencies on the spots you click on are within your privileges. The ARRL offers a handy printable U.S. amateur radio bands chart for quick reference. For additional HF contesting tips, ARRL members can enjoy a special insert in the November issue of QST Magazine, for the 2021-2022 contest season. Students at Curtin University in Western Australia proudly watched as their homemade satellite, Binar-1, was sent into low Earth orbit from the ISS in early October. Now, the CubeSat has other work to do. Ben Hartig, Binar's program manager, said that the amateur radio community is expected to make use of the satellite on the UHF frequencies between 430 MHz and 440 MHz. Students will also be listening and decoding signals the satellite is sending to determine the satellite's location and performance. The satellite, which has two cameras on board, is circling Earth once every hour and a half at a distance of 400 kilometers or nearly 250 miles above the Earth. Phil Bland, director of the university's Space Science and Technology Center, said that as Western Australia's first homegrown spacecraft, Binar-1 has a key role in the center's space program, which includes getting six more satellites launched during the next 18 months. A statement on the Binar Space website declares its mission. It says, as Western Australia's first spacecraft, this marks the start of our state's journey into space. The use of amateur frequencies on this satellite forms the backbone of an exciting opportunity to engage the community and STEM students. Our outreach program aims to inspire bold projects in space exploration. Members of the Radio Club Argentino have a number of reasons to be proud. The National Amateur Radio Society of Argentina was the sole Latin America organization to be in Paris in 1925 when the International Amateur Radio Union was created. When the IARU's Region 2 came into being, the Radio Society had a presence in Mexico City in 1964 and became part of that historic moment. The Argentine Radio Society turns 100 years old this year and its webpage offers a retrospective in photographs of its evolution over the years. Licensed hams aren't the only radio enthusiasts who can enjoy being part of this year's big celebration. The Society's Centennial Certificate Program has opened its awards program to shortwave listeners as well. According to Association Secretary Carlos Baviglia, LU1BCE, special event station L21RCA had already made more than 100,000 QSOs by October 25th. The WSJTX development team has announced the general availability release of WSJTX version 2.5.1. This release mainly contains improvements and repairs defects related to Q65 and JT65 when used with non-standard and compound call signs. Those planning to use Q65 or JT65 to make weak signal contacts involving a non-standard call sign should upgrade to this version. 
Also included is the new feature for microwave aircraft scatter, as well as repairs for bugs detected since the general availability release of version 2.5.0. A complete listing of changes is available in the release notes. Links to WSJTX 2.5.1 installation packages for Windows, Linux, and Mac are available. For the first time ever, popular pizza delivery chain Papa John's is offering its customers the chance to order pizza via Morse code to celebrate its partnership with the new World War II game Vanguard. Available from the 28th of November 2021, pizza lovers can transport themselves back in time by ordering their Papa John's treats through dashes and dots. You simply need to sign up www.papajohnmorsecode.co.uk forward slash win and winners will be selected at random for a chance to get their hands on a complimentary Morse code kit delivered in a limited edition pizza box. But those who receive a Morse code kit will need to get their head around the game to crack the code and unlock a complimentary Call of Duty video game bundle. Customers will need to guess one of the five game-related codes and translate this into Morse code, with each code correlating to a specific pizza topping. Cheese and tomato, all the meats, vegan garden party, Hawaiian or double pepperoni. Giles Codd, UK Marketing Director at Papa John's, said, We're super excited to launch a first with our Morse code ordering service. Well, you can find out more on this story at techround.co.uk forward slash news. And finally this week, Matt Breton, NHTW, and Alan McNabb II, W0ARM, share a love of the classics. In this case, the classic old Henry Radio tube amplifiers. The amps add power, of course, but there's also a warm glow, partly because of the amps' treasured history that dates back to the company's roots in 1927. Matt and Alan are co-owners of a Groups.io forum devoted to these beloved workhorses of the shack. Although the Henry Company is still in business, the advent of solid-state amps has made owners of the old-time model, such as the 3K Classic and the 3K-A, treasure them even more. Alan went on to say that the Groups.io forum provides fans and owners of Henry Amps an opportunity to share stories, tips, and admiration for what Alan calls the amp with a big and beefy power supply. Alan himself owns a 3K Classic and a 3K-A, and expects to add a 2K Classic desktop to his growing collection soon. He said that he and Matt hope to keep the Henry legacy alive for another generation of hams. In their day, he said, Henry Amps were definitely the Cadillacs of amplifiers. Many of the news and information items heard on This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the ARRL Letter, the ARRL Audio News, the Southgate Amateur Radio News Service, Southgate Vibes, AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, the FCC, the Radio Society of Great Britain and Ofcom, the SARL, the International Amateur Radio Union, the Wireless Institute of Australia, the Amateur Radio Newsline, the International Telecommunications Union, and various news sources on the Internet. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard on nets and repeaters around the country and around the world on great repeater systems like WA3PBD repeater system on Thursday evenings at 7.30 p.m. on 146.730 and 223.940, covering all of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and beyond. With special thanks to all our weekly news sources and to you, our listeners, that wraps up this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio. If you'd like to write to us, you can find everything you need, including archive editions of the news service at our website at TWIAR.net. We would like to take this opportunity to let you know that This Week in Amateur Radio is produced and distributed entirely each week by our all-volunteer nonprofit organization and that we do incur expenses for its future operations. If you would like to support us, you can visit our website for all the information. Our address once again is www.twiar.net. And now for all of us at This Week in Amateur Radio headquarters and our news team around the world.